this is not a song fest. Uh, this is not necessarily a worship service. Uh, this is really a, a Bible class. Um, you know, Christian community development is really an attempt to live in obedience to the Word of God. is that we have made the Bible just out of a little religious devotion of book. And so we read the Bible to be inspired. But the biblical thought is not reading the Bible to be inspired. Inspiration ought to be a byproduct based on our commitment to obey it. And so the inspiration should be uh, a side issue. We read the Bible and also obey it. It's not he that hears the word will be blessed, but they that do the word will be blessed. And so be you doers of the word. That's for the tape. Okay. So be you doers of the word and not hearers only. And listen to what that verse says. Be you doers of the word and not hearers only. If you be doers of the word and not, if you be hearers of the word and not doers, you deceive yourself. Because the idea of the word is to equip us for good works. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for instruction in righteousness so that the people of God may be thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Jesus Christ really came into the world to recruit a labor force, people that would do his will. And that we today is limited to the Bible. We, what we've done today, we have sort of mold God around our own need. And that has limited God. And so what we want to do then, Christian community development, is, is to put God in his proper place. The God of the universe. The God who created all of this. And the God who created us to manage this. God gave this creation to us. And he said to us to subdue it. Have dominion over it and to utilize these resources for his glory. And, and so we have sort of given these resources over to Satan and the devil. And we've given this resource over to the tycoon. And really, we, it, really in the church have become sort of beggars in a world that God gave us to manage and to subdue it. And, and so we have limited God. So what we want to do then is go back to the Word of God and really look at the Word of God. We, this is not, CCDA is not a grand religious social program. CCDA is the gathering of God's people who want to try to live out the Word of God and who are trying to put these biblical principles into practice. And so that's what we want to do here uh, 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 today. We want to, and so open your Bibles then to the little epistle of John. And for the next two, next three days, we're going to be studying um, First John. Now, First John, First Epistle of John. Now, the let's pray first. Father, we thank you for your goodness, your grace, and Lord, we thank you that we can take this time now to really study your word. And then, Lord, with the idea that we can apply this word first to our own life, and then, Lord, we can then live it out, that it might shape our character, and that we might be better people, and then that we might be creative witnesses for you in the world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is my burden. My burden right now is that I believe that we are living in a very 
opportune time in the history of the church. Um, that in the last 30 years in my lifetime, uh, it was an assumption that what was wrong in our society, and a lot of this is right, the assumption was right, that um, our system, our political, social systems was oppressive. And especially for us as black people, that's an absolute fact. Because where I came from in Mississippi, uh, prior to 1965, the Constitution of Mississippi said, and most of the southern states said, one vote, one person, which means that we will not person until 1966. And since that time, we have thrown off then some of those limitations that the systems had put upon us. But more and more today, as we look at the problem that we are facing today, they are no longer so much system problem, or you still have system problem. Most of the people are in prison. Most of the people are in the condition they're in because of their own behavior. And, and so we are seeing that most of our problems today is sin problem. And the government is seeing, is beginning to sense this, that they did not create programs to deal with them and now they begin to look to what they call the faith base because they see that there is a human moral character situation that we got to deal with. There are values and the way values are established in all societies is by people religious and family belief. Now we know in our society that the family is in trouble in our society. And so this is an opportune moment for the church to come back and to live in obedience to God and to be the kind of disciples so that we can shape the values and the character of people. Discipleship is to make us good people. It's to shape our values. Um, so let's go to 1 John and then see why John wrote this letter and why I decided to pick out 1 John for our study uh, this year. John wrote the, you, if you say John's first um, letter would be the Gospel of John. And, and what you have in John's whole thought about the character of Jesus that he was both life, light, and love. And this is, as John looked at it, this is the basic character of God, that God is life. And the biblical idea is that God blew into Adam's nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And so life, John is saying, has been made visible. The life of God, that Jesus Christ embodied the life of God. That's the first thing that John says here in, in, his, in his gospel. He also says it in 1 John as we get to it. John talks about in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and this life was a light of man. So you have in that one, one, in a few short verses there, you have both life and light. Now this light here he's talking about is the light of intelligence. And that's what we're going to deal with here. here. It's the light of intelligence. So people are intelligent, even though folks don't know God, they're intelligent. That's the light, the light is every person that comes into the world. And, and, and we all have life, life, whether you know God or not, you have life, you have life. And so John is talking here about that. And we're going to see then that we, that we have, we also have love, or we have the need for love. We have all those things. And, and, and so John here is, 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 um, 
It's talking about that. Now, what had happened in John's, in John's writing, John probably wrote the, the little epistle of John. It's probably his last writing. John was, the apostle John was the pastor of the church of Ephesus. And, um, and now John was an old man, and he has wrote his gospel of John first, and he's probably have written his, the book of Revelation, and in the book, book of Revelation, he outlines how things are going to end. And now he's writing to, this epistle here was written not as a, um, uh, an epistle, it was written more like to a family of people. Because you see, the real church is modeled after the family. We have almost turned the church into an institution and we're almost managing it and behaving like it's an institution. But the church is modeled after the family. And what God is doing is modeling families. He's building families. That's the one thing that I, uh, I remember one time I was in, a, uh, it came real to me. I was out in uh, Iowa and I was at Trinity Church out in Iowa. And, uh, and the pastor of that church is, is here. And I said to him, oh, because you go out to Iowa on a Sunday, they just sort of close up everything and go to church. And, uh, and, uh, and I said to Brother Dan, I said, uh, how many people do y'all have in this church here? It was so full, packed. You know, and I sort of thought they'd come out that morning just for me, I, because I was there. But I found out later they do that every Sunday. I mean, that's the way they do it out there. And, I, and, I, and he said, we don't count individuals in our church. We count families. I think we have over-individualized Christianity. I think that we in America talks about personal salvation and personal all of this. Of course you are saved individually, but you are saved in order to nurture your family. And not only that, but you are born into the family of God. And so the church is modeled after the family. And so John is writing his epistle here to the family. And he's talking about the family and how did the family uh, uh, behave. Let's get in then to, uh, and what was happening in the family uh, here, here was that in that day too, that the church had, was turning away from God. Now in, the, in, the, in, in John's, John's writing, we're gonna see it here, that these people had accommodated so much heresy that the church had lost its central message. You, you understand? It was, it was primary. The church was doing like today. It was pretty well serving the individual members instead of being that family within the community. That, see, the church, what we need to understand, that the church is a collective body of people. One individual do not properly represent Jesus. One individual, as they join with other individuals, constitute that body, and we are the members of that body, and to the, to the extent that we can act collectively as a family act, we can then have impact in our community. And, and most of us think that we can be good enough Christian, almost individualistic, to please God or to do the will of God. You can't do that. Because your pleasing of God even depends on the other gifts that other people have within the body that they release in your life. And so all of us need uh, a certain amount of individual Christians releasing their own gifts in our life so that we can grow to maturity. And, and so if you're thinking that you can be effective just as you and God and your Bible, you are missing it. God is working within the collective, within his body, 
within this collective group of people, within this community. The church was original, was to be a parish, a parish where people within that parish cared for each other, where the, they cared for each other, for those who was in the body of Christ, they loved them and cared for them, for those who was not a member of that body of Christ, they cared and loved for them, cared for them. It's really only the Roman Catholic Church in the world that still have a sense of the parish. The most of our reason our churches are not effective is because primarily they are commuters. And so they come to church primarily for their own nurture only. And their own nurture and growth and whatever that means becomes the end goal. And so they are coming to church. The end results of our development as Christian so that we can be effective doing the ministry. And the ministry then need to happen at the neighborhood level. And so the church really, really ought to be a community church, a neighborhood church, a church where people know each other. And, and so the whole deal today is putting nice emphasis on bigness and removing itself from being effective within a given neighborhood. And, and so there's a, there's a thought, a pattern is, that if our church get bigger, then society is going to get better. I'm not certain about that. I'm not certain that society is getting big, better in these cities where you got churches. Pastor Jake's, for instance, in the last five years have gone to Dallas. And he has got about 20,000 members in Dallas. I doubt whether or not Dallas is very much better because they got 20,000 members. Because those people, and I'm not saying that Dr. Jakes is not a good pastor and not a good preacher. I'm not saying that. He must be able to articulate and to say things very nice because all those folks are coming. But as far as the church being impactful in Dallas, and has found a place in Dallas where it is making a concrete difference, I doubt that very much. And how on earth then can you really measure whether or not they are effective? I suspect that everybody is coming there to hear that good preaching and that good music and to go back into the community and live their individualistic lives in society without tying that to the neighborhood and the community to make a difference in the community. And so what we want to do, and this is what Christian community development is about. Christian community development is about gathering people together in the body of Christ around a local fellowship and a church where those people are being equipped to rescue the perishing and care for the dying of the people in that geographical era of neighborhood so that we can begin to impact the community. And if we can get that going around the country, we could really see renewal and revival in our neighborhood, in our community. And, and so John is writing his epistle uh, to people who are, who, are, who, are, who are losing the idea of authentic Christianity. And that's what I'm taking. The, I'm taking to you guys today, basically the church have what we call from a theological perspective, have apostated. It is, it is, it, it is not, it hasn't apostated in the sense they don't come together to worship. It has apostated because it have focused itself upon itself. And, and do not recognize the fact that we are stewards of this mission that God has placed this truth and his life and his love in our hands. And that we are responsible for sharing this truth and this love to the end of the world. Let's then go and look at what John is saying here in 1 John. Now, why am I saying all of that? And, and why we are not uh, effective in the world? Let's then read, let me read then uh, what we're going to cover today. Uh, let me read down through uh, verse 4. That'll be as much as we're going to cover 
here today. And let's listen to John as we read it here. Uh, John here goes on to, look what he says. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard with our, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have held of the word of life. And now what John is letting us know right here is that Jesus Christ was the incarnated God. Now he says that in his epistle. He said, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. In him was life, and this life was the light of man. He says this now. When he, so when he's talking about in the beginning, he's going back here saying what we heard about God throughout all forever. He said what we heard about God, this God has been made visible to the world. That God was incarnated in Jesus Christ. That's what he's saying here. Look, listen to that again. That's which, that which was from the beginning, that which we have heard, that which we have seen, which, I, which we have looked upon, and our hands have held of the word of life. And so what John is saying, the life that lived eternally with God back in eternity, that life was incarnated and walked here on this earth. And that life of God was in Jesus Christ. So that Jesus Christ was the eternal life of God. And John is saying now that we touch that life. We had relationship with that life. And this word, this eternal word was made flesh and dwell among us. And John is saying we beheld his glory, the only begotten of the Father. So in verse 2, look what he says here. And this life was made visible. And this life was made visible. And we have seen it and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father, was manifested unto us. Now, uh, this eternal life, and what John is getting at here, this life here that was lived was God's life. And when we are born again, God wants to and places in us his life. We are born again. We have his life. And now we are to produce his life in the world. And with the, Now, this life here is effective because this, this God life was affected because this life was lived without sin that Jesus was the only sinless person that ever lived. So eternal life was lived without sin. We're going to see in a few minutes that God is going to give us this life. And this life is going to be in us. But what's going to handicap this life, since he's going to put this life in you and me, he put this life in Jesus. And Paul could say, I mean, John could say, we saw this life lived out in all of its glory, in all of its beauty. And it was lived out in all of its glory and all of its beauty because it was a life lived without sin. Now, what he's going to do then, this life that's going to be lived without sin, then this life is going to be given, this life, for you and me as a sacrifice and as a substitutionary death so that then he can now give us this life and even though from time to time when he give us this life we're going to sin we're going to sin we're going to sin but what he's going to do because he's going to die for our sin then he's going to be able to forgive us for our sin okay and then what he's getting at here then we can live this life effectively and we can live this life with the joy that he has. We're going we're gonna to see that. We're going to see that. He didn't sin. He that knew no sin was made sin for us. And so John was talking about when he looked at this life and saw it, he saw it was eternal life and he saw it was an abundant life. And Jesus said that to us. Jesus said that 
while Jesus was living this abundant life, he says, uh, I've come that you might have this abundant life, that you might have life, and that you might have it more abundantly. And if you can live this life abundantly like I lived it abundantly, people will see this good works in your life, and they will come to Christ because they will see this work in our life. What's going to stop this abundant life from being lived is sin. But we're going to see here that he has not only died for our sin in the past, but he has made provision for our sin now. And we're going to see then that while we're going to sin, sin do not have to stop us from living this abundant life because we're going to see we can confess that sin and we can go on and live in this abundant life. We're going to see this here as we, as we move through here. Listen to what he says here now then. He says, for, for this life was made visible, and we have seen it, and show unto you that this eternal life, and that's what he, he's calling this eternal life, is, this, is this, uh, this, this life that is to be lived with enthusiasm and joy. Okay, enthusiasm and joy. Because you see, we're going to see this, it is the joy of life is the one that's going to do the will of God. We're going to see that. Abundant life is lived out with joy and, and enthusiasm. We're going to see that here as we, as we move along. Look what he says here. Then John, uh, he's going to conclude here. Let me read these other two verses so we can conclude here. That which we have seen and heard, John said, we declare unto you that you also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And then he says in verse 4, These things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. Now, the purpose of my lecture here today is that we might have full joy. Then if we have full joy, we are able then to do the will of God. And that's our work. But it's a, you see, joy is the fuel. A joy is the energy that accomplishes God's will here on earth. You don't do God's will with drudgery. You don't do God's will with sadness. You do God's will with, with a sense of joy and a sense of gratitude when you recognize what God has done for us, that he's forgiven our sin, he's paid the debt of sin, and if we understand that we don't have to live with this sin, that we can confess it. When we understand the depths of salvation, and we could understand what this word salvation means, we then could have a sense of joy. Because the idea of salvation is this, that, that, that we was dead to God, and then when we accepted Jesus Christ as Savior, he made us alive. And then he forgave us for our sin of the past. He wiped it away. He put it behind our back that we can never remember it again, that he will never remember it again. And so he saves us from the past. But he also, salvation, has a present aspect to it, that he saves us day by day that he keeps us saved, that, that, that he forgives us and keeps us saved. And then it has another aspect to it. He has provided a safe place for us and a guaranteed place for us throughout all eternity. That means then that this salvation, that we are absolutely secure. Now, that we should no longer live unto ourselves because all that is necessary for our own living has been taken care of. And now we can no longer, no longer should live for ourselves, but we should live for him. Now we should do that with a sense of gratitude. Our life should be lived in a sense of gratitude of the salvation that God has prepared for us. We are secured in Jesus Christ, that he has provided everything for us. Now we're supposed to live that out with a sense of joy in, in life. Now, what then uh, hinders that joy? What stops us? 
What stops us then is sin. It's sin. Sin that we don't confess. As I said in my Bible class this morning, I personally believe that a lot of our sickness today has to do a lot with, with our habits of behavior, our inability to forgive. Because I really believe if we can forgive freely, I believe it opens up our life for a certain amount of healing and a certain amount of wholeness in our life. But because we can't forgive, we can't overcome the problems in our society. And I have watched that in people I know. I have watched that among people I love. I have watched people who can't get well. And I watched a lot of their not being able to get well is because they cannot give, forgive. And they carry these hurts along. And every time you talk to them, they are talking about these hurts that other people have hurt them with. And you know, as I live, and I live, and a lot of folks in here know me, you know, I don't allow people to put their hurts upon me. I don't allow people to put their hurts on, upon me. I, I confess my sin when I sin, and then I confess my sin, and I get the feeling that God forgives me. Because he said in his word, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and he's just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And he says the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, cleanses us from all sin. And so since I believe that, then I, and I won't let you put your sins on me. You know, people go walking around here trying to tell you, yeah, you hurt me. Well, I want you to forgive me. I want you to forgive me. Please forgive me, will you? Please forgive me. And when I ask you to forgive me and you don't forgive me, it is now your fault. <laughs> Until you can, it is your problem that you are left to live with. And most people are walking around with other people's problems. When I go to the divorce court, when I go to all of these places, what I see most of the time, when I see these people in the insane asylum, I see these people in prison, and most of these people can't forgive. Can't forgive. Well, you can't be spiritually healed until you can forgive. And so we live, and what is happening in the church, the fastest growing element in church work today is, is um, psychological counseling and psychological healing. And they are making a big, big enterprise out of this. And, and, and what, it, what I call it is, is that these psychologists and psychiatrists what they are doing is really making money just like lawyers is making money off of your problems that you self-inflicted with. These psychiatrists and, psych and psychiatrists and all these people, they are making money managing your sins for you. You, 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 know, you know, and, 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 they are, and they are calling them now, they are calling them now spiritual guides. <laughs> They are calling them now. Uh, you know, they got names for them, and, and I got to go see my spiritual guide every week. And my spiritual guide has got to help me, and I've got to confess my stuff to my spiritual guide. Well, I tell you, you need to be confessing that to God, so you can get rid of it, so then He can restore the joy of your life so that your life can be lived with a sense of full, full joy. And look what he says here then in verse 4. And I write these things. Now, this is the purpose of this book. This is the purpose of the whole book here. You're getting that quickly. The purpose of this book is that we might have joy. And let me then define for you what is joy. Joy comes out of our own 
resolution to be obedience to the word and the will of God. You see, see God's word is direction. You know, and so his will is what we are seeking to do. We don't always quite understand that. And so we are seeking to know the will of God. To know the will of God and to do the will of God is everything. I want you to know that. I want you to know that. that should be our daily med meditation. It's whether or not we are seeking the will. Now, if we are seeking the will of God, and if we are living within the will of God, then we're going to have the happiness and the wholeness that we need to do it with. Because he said it. Seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness and all these things that we need will be added unto us if we do that. And so what is, the, what is the, this joy? This joy then is our desire. Listen to what it says about it. This is where we get our definition from. We get it directly from uh, the word from the book of Hebrews. It said about Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despised the shame, and to sit down at the right hand of God. Now, I can tell you about the joy. The, the, the joy that he had before him was really the idea that he was coming to the earth, that Jesus was leaving heaven, coming down to this earth, was going to walk here among the sinful humanity, and then this sinful humanity was going to put him to death, that he was going to come into his own world, his own world would be so blind that his own world would put him to death, and he would be crucified and buried. And the God the Father would raise him from the dead. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, he despised the shame, and then he went and he seated at the right hand of the Father. Now, where did his joy come from? His joy came from the fact that he came into this world to live in obedience to his Father. And he lived that life completely in obedience to his Father. And nothing in this world hindered him from doing that. That's what it says in the Bible about those patriots in, in, the, in, in the book of Hebrews. He said, those guys live. They live. They didn't necessarily know what they was doing, but they were living in the complete will of God. And, and so joy, joy then, all the time. listen to this one. The, another, you get another good handle on that from um, uh, Nehemiah. Nehemiah, you know the story of Nehemiah, don't you? Nehemiah went back to Jerusalem in the midst of the poverty, in the midst of the oppression. He went back there and he built the city. He rebuilt the city. And listen to what he says about it. He says it the seventh time. He said, the walls came together and the building was finished because the joy of the Lord was their strength. And so joy has very little to do with happening. Now, when people decide they want to live in sin, then what they got to do then is create all of this happiness in life. And, 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 and you can see, and today, entertainment, entertainment is an attempt, it's a misunderstanding of joy. The Christian joy should come from his resolving his own heart that he's going to obey God and that he's going to do the will of God. And then it is sin in our life that traps us up. Let me go and I'm going to finish uh, here uh, for today. And then, so we say we have the joy. Now, how then can we have this joy? That's what I'm here for because we want to release the CCDA people so they can go back to their neighborhood and their community and be effective and make a difference. And we can set up tutoring centers. We can set up discipleship centers. And that we can be nurturing our young people back in the neighborhood. And I'm really, I was uh, uh, somewhere not long ago in a meeting. And here was the, the, the governor and a lot of other folks there. And it was in this meeting and dialogue. 
and they was talking about the need for, you know, with this economy now, you know, our economy now is at about 3% unemployment. And that's almost what you need from job to job. So our economy, we are pretty fully employed. And these people was complaining about not having no workers. And I said right openly before all these people, and I said it before I even realized what I was saying. I said to them, why don't we open the prison and take those two million people out and put them to work? Well, I know that those people, if they come out, they're going to need nurturing. They're going to need training. And why don't we, as the church, go back to our community and surround these jails and these prisons? And why don't we go back to our neighborhood? Th at the same meeting, this sheriff who was seated beside of me, he said, John, he said, what we need, we need these halfway houses. We need the churches to go back to their community and to start these halfway houses for these men and for these women. And we go, we go to prisons in Jackson, around Jackson, and you know the growing era of prison now is, and this is scary, scary, is these women going to prison. Now that's one aspect of it, but there is something that frightened me more than that. You know the largest death today in terms of homicides in the community is now these men are killing these women. That's a big thing. What we got is cannibalism in our community. At first, it was the women there was being pulled down by the men. And now what we have is these men are now killing these women. And these women being locked in prison. What we got to do, what we, that's our task now. I think we got the economy going. You know, I think we got that going. I, I think we can produce some jobs. Uh, especially we in the urban community now, we're getting a little bit of handle on some of this education. The best thing we can do, yes, we got to support the public school, but maybe some of the best thing that we can do is start some schools. Start some little schools in these neighborhoods to produce some more leaders in those communities. But what we really need to do, we really need to surround these prisons and these jails and really begin to nurture those people. And I want you to know that these people are valuable. These people in prison. Do y'all realize the fact that the people who become world changers in society is people who comes out of prison? Did you know that? The most effective people in society is people who come out of prison. The people who make revolution is people who come out of prison. And so if we could start getting into these prisons and nurturing these people in prison, and then what we need, you see, is to have these homes for them to come out. Because if they come out of prison, and if they're able to be alone within 90 days and sometime less, they're going to be back in prison. You know why? Because the very nature of prison is this, is to stop you from making decisions. And so when you're in prison, everything around you, that's the nature of having people in prison, is to, is to stop them. That's the worst thing that can happen to a person who has a free will. That is punishment itself. That is hell itself that when you no longer is able to make any decision on your own that you want to make. And when you are in prison, that's the nature of prison, is to stop you from making any decision. And so, when you come out of prison, if you don't have some people there to nurture you and to mentor you when you come out of prison, what you're going to do then is begin to think, because the mind is intelligent, and you're going to begin to think. And when you have to think, you see, every 
thing that you do, you have to do it with some kind of a sense of a precedent. You have to remember how it was done before. That's the, that's the very nature of making decisions, is you have to remember. Well, when you've been in prison for five years and you haven't made a decision in five years, you're going to remember when you get round how you made your last decision. And you know what the decision you're going to be? Is that you're going to commit the same, make the same decision that you made that got you into prison. So what we got to do, you get the idea? I think this is where I want... Oh, Hope House. Hope House is on it. We need, we need Hope Houses in every city and neighborhoods in our nation. And a Hope House is a place where we take these young people and that, it's, it's what happened. If we get these going, you know what's gonna happen? The judges, cause I meet these judges all the time. And when I speak across the country, these judges come up to me and they say, we are tired of sending all of these people to prison. And he said, a lot of these people, because of these new sentencing laws, are these three strikes and you're out. He said, a lot of these kids shouldn't be in prison. And so if we had some houses like that, the judges, the next step would be for us, then for us in CCDA, us people who are helping the government to arrive at policy. You, you know, I've been meeting with our Supreme Court justice, a, a couple of the justices. And we are talking about this now. We are talking about this whole idea. What would happen then if we would sentence these kids and they could put it at the end of the sentence? That would be the best way. We could sentence these people to these halfway houses. We would sentence them to, 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 to six months they got to serve. Six, five months of, the, of that, uh, uh, three months of that is spent in prison. And those last two months are spent in this halfway house. And at that place then, we can nurture those young people. And then we can put them back into life. That should be our task. That's where we as CCDA members need to think about. And I'm thinking about, I'd like to see every community doing that. I would like to see, we might have to take, one of the things that we are concerned about is forming these coalitions within cities, where cities, where groups work together and maybe we should start off by developing first like uh, a house for men and then a house for women because you need this. And, and it would be good if you could develop these houses and I've saw the success one, the most successful one, are those where they develop them where men and women are in the same close proximity. I think what Ms. Jackson is doing in Pasadena is absolutely wonderful. Because what's happening there, these, young, these people who are coming out of prison, they're going back either getting their wife and their children and getting back together, but almost every month or so, these people are getting married. They're getting married and they're caring for them. And so we can do that. I think that's the move. We can, well, then how do you do that? Let me, let me conclude here. Conclude here. How do you then uh, get rid of this sin that, that uh, that I don't want us to just set up an institution here just to manage those people's sin. We're talking about an institution here where young folks are going to come in and we're going to teach them how to get rid of their sin. But we also got to teach them the Word of God. And I find out that these halfway houses that work the most effectively is those where they put those people in the Bible for hours and hours and hours studying the Bible. Because the word of God is quick, it's powerful. It, it purges us. It purges us. It convicts us of our sin. Let me look at this now as we close. This then, he says, this then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light. In him is no darkness at all. Now God want us, and we're going to see that now, God want us to, it's time, to, okay, uh, God want us to walk in light. And in the light here is, the light here is walking in obedience 
to the Word of God, and when we see our sins and confront it with our sins, we confess our sins, God forgives us of our sins, and then the light is restored and that we are walking in light. Let me conclude it then. Then he says then, this is the message which you have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say then we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. Then if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, he is faithful and he is just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then look what he says here in closing. If we say then that we have not sinned in the past, and if we haven't sinned if we don't have this full joy, then he says we lie, and the word of God is not in us. So let me conclude uh, here today. What we need to do is to have this full, full joy. And to live in obedience to God, we need to keep our sins confess. Keep our sins confess. Confess our sins to God. And ask God, if go to our brothers and sisters. When we figure out we don't sin against them, go to them and tell them our sins. He said, if we care, we think we're thinking to worship God and we discover that we have all against our brothers and sisters, we are to go back and get that right with our brothers and sisters and then come back and give our gift to God so that we can have the joy of the Lord, so we can be effective in our neighborhood, in our community. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this time that we can spend together in your word. And Lord, I pray that you would just use your word that your word would really become quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. That your word would pierce uh, to the dividing of our soul and our spirits and the, and the thoughts and the intents of our heart that your word would make it. And then, Lord, that we would uh, learn how and learn how to practice, Lord, confessing our sins and confessing our sins to each other, our faults to each other asking each other to forgive us and to live a life with a sense of your presence in us. We ask all this in Jesus' precious name and for his sake. Amen. Okay, before we go, I got some announcement to make. You got an announcement to make? Nobody? Oh, that's right. No. All of CCDA members in God, at the same time, we're supposed to be his servant. Jesus came not to be served, but to serve, and then to give his life as a ransom. And we are the ones who are supposed to be following Jesus, walking in his footsteps, both teaching and healing, both feeding the hungry and caring for the sick in our society. And so as we begin to do that, people would always warn us, if you do this one, you're going to give up the other one. And so when we put CCDA together, we wanted to make certain that we don't give up that, that we, we want people to really see. Because a lot of folks are coming to us now, and they're coming because of the social program we're doing. They're coming because of the health center. They're coming because we are trying to rehabilitate uh, drug addicts. They're coming because we are working with prison. And they're coming because of that. You know, and that's a wonderful reason to come. But we don't want to give up this teaching of the Word of God and this teaching of the Word of God and us practicing it and living it out. And so to me, this is the centerpiece and we want this to always be the centerpiece of CCDA. We want it always to say that what we are doing is coming out of the Word of God and that we are ordering our steps by the Word of God. And so open your Bibles then to uh, 1 John and let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for your goodness, your grace. And Lord, thank you that we can be here together. Thank you that we can be here in New York City, our largest city in the United States. And Lord, why is sometimes uh, 
uh, uncomfortable in terms of the travel and the distance and, and being in this strange place. Lord, it is good that we're here. And Lord, we're so thankful that so many people from New York is coming out these days and joining with us. Now, Lord, we pray for this time. We pray for everybody this year that you would guide us, that you would lead us, that you would truly inspire us as we are bent on obeying you and doing your will. So now we ask that your Holy Spirit would come and teach us from your word. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. There are three basic themes in this little epistle of John that we are looking at. And I selected this epistle because um, I wanted these three themes to be brought out during our conference here uh, this week. Uh, the first theme in this here is that God is life that life have visited this world and eternal life has been revealed and that we can have that eternal life if we come to know his son and so that we get life by getting Jesus Christ. Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. And so that's one theme that's here. The other theme here is that God is light. Light. And this light here, we're going to see this light here today, is the light of God that enlightens us so that we can know the Word of God and live in obedience to Him. We're going to see that today. If we walk in the light as He's in the light, uh, we're going to see that today. And then the other theme which we are close out with, and that is love. God is love. These are the themes that we want to look at here today. The reason for this epistle then is the very fact that as I look at Christians and I'm hearing them all talking about they are burning out. And it's they are doing the work of God. And, and they're afraid they're going to burn out. It, it's because that we are trying to do the will of God in our own flesh. You see, the biblical thought is that Christ wants to live his life out in us. That's what the Apostle Paul was trying to get us to see in Galatians 2.20 when he said, I am dead with Christ. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lived in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And so the whole idea of the Christian life is that we are living out God's life here on earth. Uh, that we have this life of God, this treasure of God's life and love in these earthen vessels so that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. And so it's not us ourselves that are doing the work. It is God who is doing his will through us. And he wants us to be humble, broken vessels so that he can live his life out in us, in society. And so I see that. And what I'm finding is, as I said yesterday, that, that so many people are living these unhappy lives. That's why we have so much violence, so much divorce, so much crime. That's really, I think, is why we need all these pep uppers, why we need dope and all these other things, because we are sad and we're trying to create happiness in our life. And so the Christian life is supposed to be a life of, of joy, a life of gratitude to God. And our works for God ought to come out of what God has done for us and that we are living out our life in gratitude to what God has done for us. And that should be a life of joy. And one of my favorite verses in the Bible, it says about Jesus and his life. As he came into this wicked world, God visited this wicked world in the person of Jesus Christ. And he said, the word was made flesh and dwell among us, and we beheld his glory. And then it says also, for the joy that was set before him. 
that he endured the cross. He despised the shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the Father. And so it was the joy that was driving him on that was causing him to do it. And so the biblical thought is the joy of the Lord is our strength. That we, that we have joy, we, we, we have joy because we have salvation. Uh, uh, our, our destiny is settled. Uh, we know where we are going. And God has provided all of that in salvation. He forgave us for our sin. He forgives us day by day. And he has a place for us in heaven. He said, I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'm going to come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So salvation is complete. And that we should be living in gratitude to God because that Jesus Christ came to this world and he worked out a perfect salvation for us. And so our destiny is settled. And now we ought to be living our life out in gratitude for what he's done for us. We should almost be anticipating that time when our work is finished here that we can go to heaven and spend all eternity with him there on earth. And so we should have joy. It should be the joy of the Lord. The early disciples, when the church was developed, you know, Jesus sent them back into Jerusalem and he gave them the Holy Spirit and said that when the Holy Spirit come upon you, you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and other parts of the world. You know what that really meant when it said, you shall be witness unto me? It meant that Jesus was telling them, and these disciples understood this, that you are going to go back to Jerusalem, and in Jerusalem, you're going to die for me in Jerusalem, you're going to die for me in Judea, you're going to die for me in Samaria, and you're going to die for me all over the world. And the Testament said, these disciples counted the joy to suffer shame for his name. And so the Christian life should not be a life of dreadry. It should be a life of joy as we live the Christian life out. And then the joy of the Lord becomes our strength. You see, the joy of the Lord is the, is the energy. It is, it is the fuel. It is like uh, the gasoline that go into the carburetor that causes the car to keep going. That's what joy is supposed to be. And, uh, and so this epistle here was written in order that we might have that joy. What was happening in this early church, John could see that happening. He could see that they, they was becoming cold, that they, they was becoming indifferent. You know, in, his, in, his, in, in the book of Revelation, when he writes to the church that he passed it there in, in Ephesus, he said, you have left your first love. And since you've left your first love, you have lost your joy. And so he's writing this letter to them so they might restore that joy so that they can be effective in society. And they can take the suffering and the pain that go on with making God's will known here on earth. And let me say this. Now, the will of God is everything. I mean, that's what we should be thinking about. That should be our meditation. When, even when Jesus taught us how to pray, that was right up front in his prayer that when we pray, that we pray that God's will would be done, that his kingdom would come here on earth as it is in heaven. And what's burdened me today, that as I look at Christianity out there, that we have sort of molded God into our own image and that God is there to sort of meet our need. And that we have just sort of limited God to meet our need. And the will of God is not in the center of peace. And so the question always ought to always be, is this the will of God? I am looking to find the will of God, to do the will of God here on earth. And that we should be doing that will with, with great and exciting uh, joy. So let's go to our uh, letter here, here and pick up our study here verse by verse as we, as we go along. And I'm going to pick it up here. Let me go back and pick it up at verse 3. And then we're going to go on through and into chapter 2 here to, to, today. That which we have heard and seen, clear unto you, that you may also have fellowship with us. Now, the whole idea was that the, that the Christian church is to be um, um, a, a collective witness of people. That, that the biggest witness of us 
is yes, we can make our individualistic witness, but the biggest witness is the way we behave with each other and that other people see our behavior with each other and how we love each other, that's the biggest witness to the world. They said that was the witness of the New Testament church. That's why they call them Christian first at Antioch because those early disciples was with Jesus and they were behaving just like Jesus behaved. You, you understand? And so there was a collective behavior and so the church is a body. It's more than just one. And that's the weakness of the church. We have a church today in the world, and there are believers, individual believers in the world, but those individual believers have not bound themselves together into a family that is strong enough for discipline and development so they can be strong, so they can endure the, the adversaries of life. And so they can endure, and that comes about a family. What I'm finding out today, that it's very difficult, even my own staff, I, I find it difficult to even talk to my own staff about things that are important, because they are more concerned about themselves than they're concerned about the things of God. And they're so afraid they're going to be offended Something is going to happen, you know, so they, they have not really committed themselves to anything that is greater than themselves. And we have made Christianity into that. And all Christianity do is to just sort of keep us happy as we walk on eggshells and not offending each other in the society. Well, we need to know each other better. We need to be in fellowship with each other better. We need a cause that is a bigger cause than our cause a cause that binds us together. We need a cause like a military cause that we are concerned about our goals and objective of making Jesus Christ known and that we are in, willing to endure some of the hardship. And, and so really the Christian, that Christianity that I see is just this Christianity to make people, you know, I listen at this, I listen at these, sometimes I look at it as my wife is flipping the television, I listen at these prosperity preachers. And I want you to know that that is the ethos of our community now. Uh, they are the ones who control the networks, they control the television, and they control most of what you get as an image of Christianity. It is sort of God bless me, and if I sow a seed into this ministry somehow or another, God is going to multiply all of this back to me because I sowed a seed into this ministry. That's heresy. That's garbage in our society. You don't give to God in order to get back. You give to God because of what he has provided, because you give to God in gratitude, because it's all belonged to him. And that he made you a steward of it, and now you're trying to be a good steward of what God has given. And you hear that all the time. And I get good people, and I, when I hear, sometimes I hear people in CCD say, let's sow a seed. One of our people said, I said, don't put that in no magazine. We want people to sacrifice. We want people to give up something. We want them to give up something they already have for the cause of Jesus Christ in the neighborhood. No, don't give in order to get. Give to God in gratitude to him. And so what we're trying to do here is bring our people back to authentic Christianity, a Christianity of sacrifice, Christianity of, 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 of suffering. And I want you to know that suffering is a virtue. That's the way God sharpens our faith. Count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you fall into pain. God might not want you as healthy and wealthy as you think. God might want you to endure pain in order that you can understand pain and the agony and the suffering of others in society. And so let's go then and look at this. And so that what I'm talking about, my theme here ought to be, is that we need to develop that kind of bond, that kind of relationship to God, so we can have that relationship to each other. Now, the strength of our relationship to God is the strength of our relationship to each other. Now, I hear people all the time with this sort of religious talk. And they're always talking about how much I know God and what God said to me today, and they have no relationship with anybody around them. 
See, your relationship to God is in evidence by your relationship to each other. And so if you don't have relationship with your brothers and sisters around you, you don't have no relationship to God. And that's our theme today. And so we have a relationship with God. You see, that's when we was, when we was forgiven for our sin and we were saved and forgiven for our sin, God brought us into relationship to himself. He's been brought into that relationship. We're in his body. We are in Jesus Christ. We belong to him. Now what's going to separate us from him is going to be our sin. But this same sin will separate us from my brothers and sisters. And, and so this epistle here is written so that we might have fellowship with God and that we also may show that fellowship by our relationship to other people. And that we're going to hear here today that you can't say that you have a relationship with God and don't have a relationship with your brothers and sisters. And we're going to see that. And so the fellowship then is to be the powerful witness of God in a community and in the world. So the church here is to be the witness in the world. The church here has been left with the stewardship of this wonderful truth of the gospel. And with the whole that that's been delivered to the saints, with the whole that as a collective body of believers. Whenever I hear people too much talking about their truth and how much they know truth, and I got a church that believe in truth, it always scare me because they'll always send that truth back to some individual. And that's the way cults develop, is that somebody has, the truth was not left here with one individual. The truth was left here within a collective body. The truth has been delivered by God himself in the person of Jesus Christ, and he delivered that truth to 12 apostles. And it became the responsibility for the 12 apostles to perpetuate that truth in the world. And those apostles wrote that down in a book we call the Bible. And so it was not given to one individual. And it's not retained in the world by one individual. It's attained by the fellowship, by the body, by the presbyterian, by the elders within a local church. They're the ones that's there to contend for the truth, not just the pastor. The pastor is there to proclaim it and to nurture that. But then he has some people to oversee him or her so that it makes certain that that truth reflects the historical teaching of the Bible. So no one person have all the truth. It is left to the, to the body. And so let's go look then at this. So verse 3, let's go back there and let's get moving here. So that we might have fellowship with the Father and with the Son, verse 3. And these things write we unto you then, that if you can have fellowship with the Father and with the Son, okay, and fellowship with each other, then we're going to have the joy that we need to do the work of God. So your joy might be full. Now he's going to get, begin to explain that in verse 5. Listen to what he said in verse 5. This then is the message which we have heard of him. And John is talking about the message that he has heard directly from Jesus Christ. This is the message that we have heard of him, and we declare this unto you, that God is light. Now, we're going to see what the darkness is going to be. That God is light. And, and, and the darkness is going to be when we begin to hate each other and kill each other, as out with each other, we're going to see that we are walking in darkness. But we are walking in light. We're walking in fellowship and in love with each other. And then we're able to impact the society around us. Listen at him, what he says here. This then is the message which we have heard of him. And we've declared this unto you, that God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. And verse 6 says this. Listen to this. For if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. So, look, verse 7 says, but if we walk in the light, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, then he says we have fellowship one with another. You see, walking in the light, being in a relationship with God, is being in relationship to your fellow man. And so that in that local body, you can be impactful because sin is not only going to trip you up, 
but it's going to trip up the whole neighborhood and the whole community. That's the little story of AI. Do y'all know the story of AI? When God was with the nation of Israel, calling them out of Egypt, in a very powerful way, God was there. He was there by the pillar of cloud by day. He was there in the pillar of fire by night. He was there hovering over the tabernacle, and he was there to help them. But when they went into a, a city, and they took that city, and what happened there, one of the people there, Achan, stole some gold and silver, and he kept that to himself. He hid it in his own tent. He was more concerned about himself than he was about the collective. And so when they got ready to go fight the battle again, they lost the battle. And they wanted to know then why were they losing the battle. And they were losing the battle because one of the members in the camp had sinned. And they couldn't win the battle because one of the members within the local church had sinned. That's a part of the fellowship. And then they could not win the battle until Achan come forward and confessed his sin. And when he confessed his sin, they went out and they were able to win the battle. See, sin then stops not only us individually, but it stops we the church then from being effective as we be the body of Christ in the community. That's what he's trying to say here, here in this. For we say that we have fellowship with him, and we say that we have fellowship with him, and walk in darkness, we, 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 we lie and do not the truth. But he said, if we walk in the light, as he's in the light, then we have fellowship one with another. And then the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, cleanses us from all sin. Now, the biblical thought of Jesus' death on the cross is that he shed his blood historically for the remission of our sin. And he provided that. But the biblical thought is that Jesus' blood is available right now. And that same blood that was shed 1,900 years ago, that same blood is available right now to wash away my sin day by day. There's an old hymn I love so much. I have to depend upon it myself. It says, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's vein. And sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilt and stain. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us now, day by day, from all of our sin. And it cleanses us so that we can have fellowship with God and we can live that fellowship out in our relationship to each other and that we can be impactful uh, uh, in the world. Let's go to verse 8 then. So his blood is what cleanses us from sin. Then verse 8 said, if we said that we have no sin, uh, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. Now, what did he mean here? What he's actually saying here, if we say that we don't get tripped up sometime. I remember when I was a, a little and I used to hear of a good old sanctified Church of God in Christ people uh, say these things like, uh, I'm free from sin, or I haven't thought about sin in the day. And I used to say, that set too high a standard for me. In fact, it's too a high a standard even today for me. Uh, because I think about sinning. I think about sinning sometimes. But when I think about sinning, I also know that when I think about sinning, I need to go back to the cross again and ask him to forgive me for that thought of sin. But I do think about sinning. Think about sinning. And that's what he's saying here. If you say that you don't get tripped up from time to time and think about sin. If you say, what is sin? A sin is doing something that you know is wrong. But sin is not doing some of the things that you know is right. And that's called a sin of omission. And we know a lot of time the things that we ought to be doing that's right. We don't do that. And so we need to confess that before the Lord so that his blood can cleanse us so that we can have that kind of relationship that we need to have uh, in, our, in, in, in our society. Now, the big, always the big question is, because some people teach this, some people teach that every time you sin, you got to get saved all over again. I know that a lot of folks take that, and so a lot of folks believe that. Believe that. Uh, I, I think that's a, a little bit of a misunderstanding of the Bible, to say the least. 
when you sin, you break your relationship to God. And the big deal is that you also begin to break the relationship you have with your brothers and sisters. And that leaves you ineffective. You are not doing, you cannot do the will of God. And that's what you should be set on doing, the will of God. So when you sin, you cease to be able to do the will of God. You cannot do the will of God while you're living in your sin. And so the idea here then is to say that we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves. We're deceiving ourselves. And he goes on further than that and says, he goes on and say then, then the truth is not in us. The truth is not in us. And that we can be deceived. We can be deceived. I, I was able to see that in the South when I went back there. I could hear those white preachers on the radio and black preachers, but particularly these white preachers would be preaching these uh, sermons, uh, saying all these good things about Jesus, but there was no relationship they had to any other black people within the neighborhood. And I would hear him preaching these sermons like, let's go back to the religion of our founding fathers. And I would say, I don't want to go back there. I'd be a slave. Your founding father's religion is not that good. I said, why don't we go back to the Bible and try to find out what the Bible meant? Let's go back and let's try to live by the Bible. Let's don't live by the religion of our slave owners. Their religion was not good enough. Let's go back to, well, what had happened though, they had been self-deceived. You know, every once in a while, I get a little staff member on my thing, and sometimes I get a wonderful young white person on there, and they are more concerned about their historical religious doctrine that held people in subjugation. They are more concerned about that than reaching out to the poor and the hurting in society. And I look at them, and I feel sorry for them. We need a religion that authenticates itself with reality in society. We need a religion that is stronger than our race and our culture in our society. You get that? And so this is what he's, he's saying here, that we can be deceived. We can be deceived. And a lot of us is, and I tell you, if you are too tightly held to your denomination of views, that can be deceptive. Because all of that has a certain amount of heresy in it. All of it. So don't be, don't be so tightly held. And, and you know, I see denomination as administration. I do not see them as being something that God ordained. I see them as something that God might have used, and he probably still can use them, because God can use, just because you got a denomination name, don't stop God from using you. <laughs> but, but, it, but it don't even assure you that God is going to use you. Because God is not dealing on that level at all. So don't get too sold out to that. You understand? As I say, except if, you, if you're Presbyterian, that's wonderful. If you're a Baptist, that's wonderful. That you have that in your administration. If you're a Pentecostal, that's wonderful. Nothing wrong with that. But don't try to replace that with God. I meet these little narrow-minded people all the time. When they ask me whether or not I'm a Christian, they're going to put the test by one of their little narrow doctrinal statements. That's too narrow. That's too narrow. That we should, we should trust, we should, we should judge the Christians by their behavior. The, ch the, ch the, the church tree should be known by the fruit it's bearing. And if it's bearing good fruit of love and compassion and all of those fruits of the Spirit, then we can say, that's good fruit. But if it's hatred, even of people who don't believe like you believe, then that means that you don't quite understand in society. So look at this now. So he says then, if we confess our sins, verse 9 says then, this is the way we get rid of our sins. What do it mean to confess? Let me share with you what it means to confess. To confess is to you agree and speak it out to God what God already knows. That's what it means to confess. To come and to say to God what God already knows that you've sinned. And so if we come before God, we confess our sins uh, to him uh, before God. And you, you, you know that the confession too, if your sins is sins that cause each other pain, then you really need to uh, experience some form 
of repentance. That's really important. That's really important because when God's spotlight of love shine into your life that brings about repentance, it shows you what you consider to be a very little sin is a very big sin before God. And repentance is then you begin to see that sin as God sees it. You begin to see that sin as something big. And what you thought was little now becomes big. And now you cry out to God and you say, God, I have sinned. I have sinned, I have sinned, and you confess that. So confession, you know, my, I listen to people sometimes, and they, they take, I, I work on altars sometimes when they're having revivals and things, and I listen to people talking to people once they come down to accept Jesus Christ as Lord of their life. And, and sometimes those people haven't had a good enough vision of their sin. I, I, I think when people get a good vision of their sin, it's going to create some pain and a little agony in their life. You, you know, you know, when you see your sin as being the way God sees them, he sees them as awful. And that should bring about some repentance. I think that we have made the expression of knowing Jesus Christ a little bit too easy. I believe that there's a, there's a, there's a power of conviction that ought to come with people seeing the depths of their sin. And so this confession here is not just a little old bitty deal. It's a big deal when we confess our sin. Then he says, though, that God, he is faithful, and God is just, and that he will forgive us of our sin, and that he will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I like that. I like that. And I know when I was first converted, you know what I would do uh, when I first knew, I, I realized that God forgave me for my bad sin that I committed. But then what I would do when I was first converted, I would be thinking about the sins that I had done. And I would be asking God, God would remind me of those sins. And I would be continually confessing those sins to Jesus Christ until I felt like that I was absolutely free from that sin. So if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us of sin. And then he says in verse 10, listen to what he said in verse 10. Uh, again, he, because he's saying things, he's repeating things. Here he says, but we say that we have not sinned. Uh, we, he've already said that once in this passage, but now he's saying it again. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. This is strong language. That if you say that you have not sinned, you are making God a liar. And he says, and his word is not in us. And then he goes on here in, in, in verse 1 of, of chapter 2. He says, my little children, these things write unto you that you sin not. He said, I'm writing this unto you. You know, because that's where you, 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 if you, be, you have to be careful here with this passage because you make this easy Christianity. This is Christianity made a little bit too easy. This is Christianity without repentance. This is Christianity without pain when you make it easy. And that's what I'm trying to show you. When you repent, when you see the depth of your sin, you see it as sinful. And then he, that's why he keep repeating this. That's why he keep repeating this. My little children, these things write on to you that you sin not. You know, you know, if it's this easy, you, you know, then you can say, well, if I sin, well, so what? I'm just going to confess it to the Lord. And you're going to assume upon God, sin is bad. Sin is bad. And so we don't need to live with that sin in our life. And we need to confess it before God. My little children, these things right unto you, you should sin not. But then as he think about that, he also think about the depths of God's grace. I mean, God's grace is wonderful. You don't have to live with your sin. You don't have to live... You know, and I, and I meet people, the hardest thing that I find out in my working with all of you five or six hundred organizations across the country is to, for you to acknowledge when you have done wrong. Isn't that hard? For you to acknowledge when you have done wrong. You understand? When you see, when you see that, but he says here, when you sin, and when we sin, uh, we have an advocate with the Father. That means that not only have Jesus died 
to provide a salvation for us and to provide the provision for our sins to be confessed day by day. But Jesus is also sitting up on the right hand of the Father. And from that position, he's looking down here on us. And, and really what he wants us to do and he, what the Holy Spirit to do and what he wants the good teaching of the Word of God to do is to convict his people who are walking in sin. Because he really can't advocate for them until they ask him. You understand? He can't advocate. He's standing out there and he's waiting on you while you're walking out of fellowship with him. This is grace. This is grace. You are walking down here on earth out of fellowship with God. You, you're walking down here on earth not being effective. You're walking down here on earth not having a relationship with your brothers and sisters. And Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father. And it's almost like he is sitting there waiting and he's saying, Oh, I wish that my child would confess. If my child would confess, then I could forgive them and they could have this joy restored. And so he's sitting there ready to tell the Father. But even if we don't do that, even if we don't do that, even if we don't confess, and as we, and even if God has that, that sin cause us to go to heaven to be with him, I think Jesus is up there with the Father and saying, this is my child. This is my child. Uh, this is my disobedient child. This is my disobedient. He is there to plead our cause. He's there hoping that he can answer our prayers in terms of we are confessing. But even if we don't confess, he's an advocate there. He's there for our sin. And not only he's there for our sin, but he's there for those people out there who have not ever confessed their sin. And all they have to do is to confess it. That's what it means here, that he's not only advocated for our sin, but he's for the sins of the whole world. It means that he has provided redemption. And he has provided forgiveness for anybody in the world. So anybody in the world who would cry out to God and say, I'm a sinner and I need help. God who is seated at Jesus, who is seated at God's right hand, would say, that's my child. That's my child. And then he would be a saved person. Let's continue here as I bring this, uh, this time here to a close. This is where I want to get to. This is the verse I really wanted to get to uh, here today, is how can we know that we know God? That's in verse 3. That's important. That's important. How can we know that we know him? We can know that we know God if we walk in his commandment. And what is his commandments here? His commandment is this. This is God's commandment in the Old Testament. This is God's commandment in the New Testament. This is the way that we can know that we believe in Jesus Christ. This is the way we can know that we are a child of God. And the way that you can know that you are a child of God is by the way you love your sisters and brothers around you. He's going to say that in that passage. If we say that we love God, and hate our brothers, we lie and do not the truth. And so to say that you know God is to have this kind of relationship to his brothers and sisters. You know, uh, the other day they called, these people did this wonderful honor thing to me. And as I sit there and listen at that honor, and I realize that the only reason that I've been able to do anything that I've been doing during these 40 years, it has been because of the friends, the brothers and sisters that God has given me. And that's the way we need to understand that. We, need to, we not need to be boasting before God, talking about what God has done for me. God says, give and it shall be given unto you. Press down, shaken together, will your brothers and sisters give to you. We're supposed to develop a faith that we not only trust in God, but we trust in each other. And that we see that our help and our support comes from each other. Well, let's pray, and we'll be back again uh, uh, tomorrow. Okay. Father, we thank you so much for your goodness and your grace. And we thank you for this time together. Now we pray for Thaddeus as he come to talk to us and to share with us 
Give him liberty. Make him a creative witness for your glory and honor. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, we, uh,